Hello and welcome to the programme. Britain 2020 and the headlines this week were of arrest as part of a major investigation into modern slavery and drug offences. Police describe it as forced labour. On the round table, we're looking into that across the continent. In this, the first in a series on modern slavery. It is defined as work or service which people are forced to do against their will under threat of punishment. From child mining across the world to the drugs dealing mentioned earlier, here we meet those trying to end this slavery, forced labour. Forced labour is the most common type of slavery, it affects millions of people globally and is often found in industries where there is little regulation, such as agriculture, domestic work, mining and manufacturing. According to the International Labour Organization, forced or compulsory labour is all work or service which is exacted from any person under the threat of a penalty and for which the person has not offered himself or herself voluntarily. There have been recent reports of forced labour in developed and less developed countries. The US has barred imports of Malaysia's top glove corporation over suspected debt bondage and abusive work and living conditions. Top Glove has submitted information to the US Customs and Border Protection to prove it did not use forced labour. The UK had its own forced labour scandal recently with the supplier for fashion brand Boohoo allegedly paying its workers $4.60 an hour, less than half the national minimum wage. So if forced labour can happen anywhere, is it impossible to prevent? I'm very pleased to say that we have joining us from London, Jasmine O'Connor, Chief Executive of Anti-Slavery International. We head to Washington, D.C. to say hello to Bukini Waruzi, Free the Slaves Executive Director, and back to London, where we find Safia Mini, founder of People Tree. She'll explain what that is and author of Slave to Fashion. Great to have you all on the program. Um, it is the most common form of slavery, Jasmine, I have read. Where do we find it and in what form? We find it everywhere. Um, around the world, at any one point in time, there's roughly 25 million people in this particular form of slavery. Um, it's common in all sorts of industries very often industries that have a lot of workers um, and little regulation. So that could be in agriculture, manufacturing, construction and domestic work. It's actually the most common form of slavery in the UK and indeed in every country. How would you define it though? Because it could be that they are forced to work because they have to work. I think the way we would view it is that people are forced to work <clears throat> under some kind of threat of punishment. So it's a context where, you know, you can't really argue that if there's no decent work, that slavery, you know, is the option. The fact is slavery should never be an option and there should always be decent work for everyone everywhere. I want to go to Bukeni in Washington, D.C. Um, and I was interested in a back and forth you had with our producer um, about what you described as the comeback of this form of slavery. And we said, well, does that mean it's gone away? And this is what you wrote back. It has overwhelmingly spread everywhere across the globe. While historically you'd think it's ended, but actually not. It is now everywhere and taking different shapes and forms. Was that a surprise to you to learn that? Well, uh, not really very surprising for me to learn, but uh, it was quite shocking, uh, you know, in terms of the magnitude. Um, when we talk about, uh, you know, slavery, uh, in many people will think, okay, slavery ended years ago with the Emancipation Proclamation and all of the historical, uh, you know, uh, perspective that happened during that time. But also, you know, uh, in Africa, we saw in many other countries, we saw the waves of independences, and we thought that was the end of another kind of slavery. But actually, uh, it was just one type of or, or, or form of slavery that, that did end in theory. But um, nowadays, what we've seen is, you know, the forms of slavery that has occurred in the 
uh, last century is just overwhelming. You For see, example, slaves themselves don't have to be physically exported. They can be enslaved within their own country. I went to Mauritania about 15 years ago to do a report. I think we've got some snaps of it. These were people who were forced to carry water to the fields. They filled up rubber inner tubes with them walking in the scorching sun on the edge of the Sahel Desert. I mean, the conditions in which they lived and worked um, were appalling. Now, they didn't even know that they were slaves. They just knew that this was the only form of life they had. Exactly. And that is one of the, the, the challenges we have uh, when we do the sensitization of the raising awareness. The victims themselves often think uh, it is a normal situation. They don't, you know, you know not necessarily apprehend that as really a, one of the worst forms of slavery. Uh, in addition to that, you have the condition. When we talk about the conditions, uh, you know, nowadays you have, for example, climate change that really forces people into, you know, forms of slavery. Of course, we can talk more about that. Uh, but you know, you have these forms or these conditions that are structural, that are systematic, and other, uh, and others really are much mostly political. Yeah. Uh, so we, we we that way we when we say over, you know, the 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 scope has changed and has really broadened so much in all the industries everywhere we live people you know trapped in in bonded labor people uh, who cannot get out of that structure because you know the conditions they have to pay debt yeah and, and I, I want to come back to you in a, in a little while and ask you about the difficulties that people face if they become freed from a form of slavery but Safia you've been nodding vigorously and um, hoping to come in as soon as possible since the program began. So first of all, I'll get you to react to what you've heard. And then I want to ask you about fashion in particular. Well, yes, clearly, uh, slavery is uh, a, a, the, the, the new form of neo-colonial, the, the, the liberalist, um, dysfunctional capitalist system that, that we know that the Financial Times and Newsweek and, and Time and everybody from really last year, that, that watershed moment of the Greta effect and XR and the school strikes, really, you know, beginning to talk about the dysfunction of capitalism. And I think, you know, slavery, modern day slavery is a consequence of a, an unaccountable, <laughs> untransparent system. Um, you know, we do not count the externalities, even though we have Legisla legislation in place in the majority world, global south, and in the, the so-called first world. You know, we know that um, this is this is largely flouted. So, you know, yes, we have a modern slavery act here in the UK, but we don't have the rigor, the ability to enforce modern slavery within uh, amongst the the companies of 36 million turnover a year or more. So, you know, we 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 know we have the framework. But, but we do not have the ability to... But, but are they not, that. those companies that you mentioned, the 36 million plus a year in terms of turn turnover, are they not obliged to say, by law, what they are doing to make sure that there is no slavery in their business? And if, if they are, why yes. are they doing it they, or not? Yes, they can write on their website um, that they have taken no actions to eradicate modern-day slavery, or they can do as many good businesses will do, and they can talk about the beginnings of the capacity building to eradicate modern day slavery in their very, uh, very multi-tiered um, supply chains. And you can imagine that unless you get the financial community, the ESG managers, the environment, social and governance um, analysts to truly engage with this as a topic, they will continue putting, you know, millions of, of, of pounds worth of investment <clears throat> into the fashion high street. Um, so, you know, what we need is we need an empowering environment from uh, from business and finance because we know that governments don't don't have um, the the ability and the motivation to deliver on eradicating modern day slavery. Okay, I, I, it is okay for you at any time to say whatever you want while somebody else is speaking. But I'll throw this one at Jasmine. Um, today's national newspapers in the UK, Apple, big company Apple, imported clothes um, from a place in China and a firm facing US forced labor sanctions. And only last week, the chief executive, Tim Cook, telling Congress he describing uh, describing forced labor as abhorrent, we would not Tolerated. So the two things here, my question is, is this hypocrisy or is it simply impossible to know everything that's going on 
down the supply chain? Most governments um, seek to try and eradicate modern slavery um, through having a sort of transparency clause. So you have to say, um, you know, what you're doing to, to tackle slavery. But the legislation very often doesn't go far enough in that it doesn't really mandate business to take proper root and branch action. And so without commenting directly on the Apple case, I think a lot of uh, corporations are getting away with it, basically, uh, in, in the respect that they are ticking a box often on a form or putting a statement on their website, but they're not looking seriously at taking the right kind of investigative action and putting in the right kind of safeguards right the way through their supply chain to, to ensure that slavery isn't occurring. Yeah, so so they the, would have to go looking for it and they're reluctant perhaps to do so because that would be too difficult? Well, I, I don't buy that. Um, from huge corporations that are making billions uh, of pounds by selling whatever clothes or gadgets they are globally. I don't, I don't buy the fact that, um, you know, it, it's too difficult to go looking. It, it is possible. It takes, it takes time. It takes effort. But I think the other piece in it is that sometimes it's their practices that are deriving slavery. So at times the sort of purchasing practices um, that, that, that seek to, you know, uh, buy a, a large amount from one factory one moment and then switch to another the next that ask for um, products at very short notice. We see this in particular in sort of fast fashion, that actually, you know, they are part of driving these systems of slavery. So it's a multifaceted piece that needs looking at altogether. And when it comes actually to the to the Uyghur in, in China, uh, you know, there's a significant campaign now with a number of civil society organizations and unions all calling for corporations to numerous brands, every single brand, basically, to say what they are doing uh, to, to yeah. tackle this challenge and actually to divest, in particular, from cotton purchasing I, I, from China and, in particular, that part of China. I want to bring Bukhani back in because although fashion makes the headlines, I mean, you, you've put, a, I think, a warlord in Africa behind bars for uh, forced labour and child trafficking, um, you, you've freed women from domestic servitude. It takes all forms, does it not? It's all about, you know, uh, accountability. Uh, so, so hypocrisy is there because when you tackle Apple, uh, you can see the final, you know, uh, uh, you know, you, you know, the final step in the whole process. But when you look at where Apple got all those materials, the raw material, forced labor started there and it goes all the way up to the top. So it is very systemic. It is really, really structural. And the, the, the means for accountability is still a huge problem because uh, the imp implementation of, of these rules, whether from monitoring and, you know, and also evaluating and reporting, but you find very huge problems, gaps, when it comes to accountability. Yes, you can hold them accountable, which is great, but the accountability should start from the bottom, uh, from the bottom up. That's how the whole channel is. Yeah. So when we talk about forms, you have to look at where these money, you know, where, where these, these raw materials come from. Uh, they come from world, you know, third world countries where the, the, the legislations, you know, co corruption, corruption is rampant where there is no mechanism for other accountability, where everybody is at the mercy of anything that comes left and right. You so see, what, we, what I'm really trying to drive at here is, and, and we're talking about fashion to some extent, um, it might be easier to put pressure on retailers, cust uh, people who buy uh, the goods, than it is to stop um, child mining in Africa, than it is to yeah. stop children being used in agriculture, uh, women being used in agriculture. Um, as domestic servants basically bonded to, to their employer. Um, it's yeah. very difficult to stop that, isn't it? Because it's not, it, it doesn't have international ramifications. No, I don't agree that is difficult. It might be challenging, but it is doable and not definitely difficult. You know, because all of this is not being done in secret. It is known. We know the channels. We, we know where this fashion industry is 
got their raw materials. We, we, we know who is involved. And we also know where they are and who they are. The problem becomes, uh, when, as, as I said, uh, where the accountability process starts. So if you can at mm. least send a strong signal in, in one aspect of, of the channel, that will have a strong ramification into the others. You know, for example, if you set an example that if you tackle uh, how, for example, uh, you know, child labor is used in fashion industry, that might necessarily impact how we women are used into the the um, you know you know you know into the the. Yeah. Uh, with the factory industry. Yeah, I, so I, want to, I want to ask Safia this one. Um, please explain to me, um, people tree during this, if, if you would like to, but I want to ask you whether it is more shocking that we are seeing elements of forced labour in the developed world rather than the developing world. Well, I, I think it is um, surprising that uh, our, our own uh, legislative framework isn't strong enough to be able to, uh, to, to root out uh, the the, the um, highly exploitative slave labour that we have that we've seen um, with the the scandals in fast fashion um, recently and, and you know it's not enough just to see the the, the share price plummet um, and, and that to be some indication that fashion companies need to get their act together I mean really to build on um, you know the, the previous speaker's point you know we we have this 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 structural um, uh, sl slavery that is built into our, our trading systems um, that, you know, quite rightly is about, you know, buyers taking a different approach to, um, to, to buying. You know, you, you cannot have fast fashion brands going into a supplier and saying, I want to buy it at the same price as two years ago, when whether it's in the first world or the, the global south, we know inflation is, is you know, 10% um, in, in most um, global southern countries. Um, so, you know, that, that cost is being then cut from labour cost. It means that rather than employing adults, you'll employ children instead, or you'll, for, you'll, you'll employ forced labour. Um, and, and, you know, to the point about can it be managed or can it not be managed, of course it can be managed. You know, fashion is all about detail. The devil is in the detail, whether it's the Pantone colour or the button size or, you know, the, the delivery date and the way that it's packaged and how it's labelled. So, of course, it's possible to go, you know, beyond tier one, which is the manufacture stage, um, you know, down to to the, the second and third tiers. And, you know, if we're looking at uh, conflict minerals, we're also then looking at, the Samangali system in, in southern India, which is famed for pushing children into the cotton mills that then feed the conventional cotton into um, the textile and fashion industry. So, you know, this again is a, is a piece of accepted slavery. Yeah, that is are, happening. are customers, you think, prepared to pay extra to know that it is entirely ethical or as ethical as it is possible to be? Yes, they are prepared to pay. And actually, the difference is not very great. The, the problem is... If you've got, if you've got, you know, a, a handful of, of ethical brands like People Tree that have, you know, innovated fair trade and sustainability throughout their supply chains, they're going to be tiny. What you need is a regulatory framework to ensure that the main, that mainstream business practice will only be allowed to operate if it operates with human rights and environmental regulations central to everything it does. Can, can, can we talk a little bit about the difficulties for individuals involved, Jasmine, and, and everybody? Uh, when I met those people who were the water carriers in Mauritania, um, they were bonded labourers. They, they did not really know what they would do if they weren't doing that. They were frightened of leaving. Mm -hmm. They weren't in chains physically, but emotionally they actually were. How do you convince somebody? Their life would be better if they stepped outside that that circle. You know, you can't ask somebody um, to to leave that context if actually the situation they would find themselves in could be even worse. So first and foremost, you've got to have holistic solutions. And the way that we work at anti-slavery is in supporting people out of slavery through kind of holistic solutions that involve education that involve access to decent work, that involve support for trauma recovery and building their lives. I think the other point that's really important is that there does have to be a criminal lens on this. 
there does have to be a sense in which those that are doing the exploiting are held to account and those that have been exploited are understood to be to be victims and are afforded the sort of protections that they need under the law not to end up um, you know being the victim of, of whatever repercussions. Can, can I read this out be. to you? This is from Amnesty International. Forced labour often takes place outside the scope of the public eye. Victims are difficult to trace. They are vulnerable and feel shame. Therefore, they are afraid to speak out. They know, some of them, what sort of situation they're in, but it's not worth their while to say so. What we've got to do is we've got to make it worth their while to say so. And where we are working uh, uh, around the world with um, communities of survivors, with community-led organisations of, of people who are vulnerable to slavery, they're the ones that understand how to reach their, their peers, as it were, and how to support people out of slavery. So the kind of policy solutions that we need you know, have to be led really from the grassroots up to the global context so that they are real world and are able to reach and support the individuals who are most vulnerable. I think the other point to make on this is that we've got to be um, careful about the kind of immigration systems that we have, because sometimes uh, individuals, rather than being supported as victims, are actually treated uh, in, in a criminal sense by immigration systems that crack down on the fact that they may not have uh, you know, a full set of of papers in place because they might have been yeah, and those people uh, who brought, brought them here yeah no exactly that that is something that they can exploit and put pressure on yeah, absolutely um, let me just throw this one out there if i may but kenny you might care to to answer it um international labor organization part of the united nations guy Ryder, head of the group says slave labor and I called it forced labour at the top, but of course we should simply call it slave labour, is like a virus because of its capacity to mutate. Um, what did he mean, do you think? Uh, slave labour, uh, you know, because of the e e economics of it, and also, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know um, uh, uh, how uh, very spread it is. Uh, you know, it can mutate from industry to industry, from community to community, everywhere in the world. Whether you are in the southern hemisphere or in the northern, you will, you know, you can, you will still see all of that happening in front of eyes. You know, we we have, you know, slave labor almost everywhere in in the world, and I, and you know, you know, and, and I think the main question question is, you know, as we understand slave labor in its practices and also the policies that enable, uh, you know, slave labor to persist, mm. the, you know, the question then becomes, what will be the best solution to tackle slave labor? Okay, final and one, Safir, if, if I may. Um, what does it say about the world in 2020 that it is thought that there are more people involved in slave labor now than at any time in human history? I mean, it, re it represents a uh you know, a, a lack of awareness. And I think, you know, you've seen, for example, um, many different networks to promote fair trade and, and um, human rights. And you've seen Fashion Revolution, for example. There are lots of platforms that have tried to raise awareness of this. Um, you know, the, 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 the many companies actually that pushed for the modern slavery um, bill to be uh, passed for supply chains um, in late 2015 in the British government. So, but, but, but the awareness piece needs to be in existence. And, and I, I absolutely agree with my colleagues that, you know, until it becomes um, unacceptable that the human traffickers house is 10 times the size and, and it's known by the whole village that, you know, he will, he will look after your daughter if she falls on hard times at the age of 14 by selling her, whether it's into prostitution or into a garment factory, or whether it's, you know, the, the, the knowing activity of brokering um, people into factories in, in, in the UK. So I, I think, you know, we, we do need to raise awareness on the disgrace that modern slavery is. We all need to be un, uh, fully aware that this is about, uh, it's about power, 
It's about you know the the the, the lack of accountability and, and transparency. But for me, this is really about getting the financial and business community involved. We've seen yeah. lots of great initiatives from um, from fashion businesses in working with majority world governments to understand you know what are the hiring practice and how does that lead to um, to bonded labour? How how does it need to be changed? Um, and we've seen now finance beginning to wake up to what would the ESGs look like to truly put this convergence of crisis centrefold, which is you know, the, the crisis of, of climate, of ecological breakdown and of social breakdown. So, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to business and climate pushing this piece. Well, OK, uh, the more you have to say, the more programmes like this that discuss it, then I suppose the more it will become, if not centre of attention, then it'll move slightly closer to the mainstream. Thank you very much indeed, Safia. Thank you, uh, Bukaini. Jasmine, we're going to see you again because this is uh, just part of a series on modern slavery. This one was about slave labour. We're talking about child slavery in another programme and about women and slavery in a third. We thank you for taking part in this discussion. Thank you very much indeed for watching. From me, David Foster, and from the Roundtable team, goodbye for now.